So, Kilesh, tell us uh, your impressions of the conference that just ended. Um, how I would look at when I reflect back quickly is, uh, I think, a good opportunity for people from across sectors to meet each other. I think that's an important, uh, I would say, even a beginning to an extent by my experience because many a times we end up uh, coming into conferences and meetings where people from the same sector are there, which has its own utility. But I think here people from different sectors were there, which I think was good because there were also a lot of differences, which is good to come on the table. As I saw it, banging heads together yes. so that we come up with something useful. Absolutely. Yes, but uh, what what were the points of divergence? There were a few. Uh, yeah. How do we how do we work on those? I think economics uh, was surely one. Uh, I mean, what struck me was this discussion about uh, being able to price everything and uh, you know certain aspects of our life or society being invaluable, which you can value but you cannot price. Nevertheless, I think today you know, the minister from Pakistan, I think he made a very good point also about being able to. You know, still, because policymakers listen to when we are able to convert uh, realities into costs, basically, and the pricing. So I'm in two minds right now, honestly. But I think that is a good point of discussion, uh, and that is an important point to be taken forward, I think, in the times to come also. Uh, what else uh, did we disagree on? Uh, I think some certain smaller issues, I would say, but maybe because we personally, I mean, we, uh, you know, one of the impressions I have is that we are a lot of practitioners here. And as one of our participants said, that we are not so many of us academicians, so the academic rigor is a question. We speak a lot from our own limited practice experiences, which need not be uh, the end all. So, I mean, in one instance, for example, when we were discussing about uh, for the role of information and uh, the people who are in the business of providing information, they feel one way, that they're equipped, they're ready, they're prepared, they, they have the access to infrastructure, whereas others who are thinking about uh, the people at the bottom most levels of uh, poverty and deprivation, they have a reflection and an experience that perhaps that infrastructure or even that capacity is not yet there. So those were some of the other points of uh, disagreements. Uh, I think the information group also provided some concrete data, uh, which I do think works. I think it's, it, it makes the arguments very clinching many a times. Uh, so I think that was it. Another thing that it comes to mind, I don't know whether it's a disagreement or not, but uh, you know the micro and macro kind of a divider of perspective. Uh, I'm experiencing this more and more in the last two or three years. Every time a good case study comes from the field, I think first we should acknowledge the people who've done good work in the field. We shouldn't uh, kind of denounce them or decry their work or minimize their work by saying that what implications it has on policy. And not only implications, I mean, have you been able to influence policy? Maybe it's not their role necessarily to influence policy. Maybe it's the role of others and everybody needs to work in synergy. But uh, every time in conferences nowadays, I sometimes find even a level of cynicism when a good case study is presented on solid groundwork. So while at one level we respect that empirical evidence and we say that empirical evidence is required to be able to influence policy. On the other hand, immediately such case studies are followed by questions of, oh, yeah, 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 that's fine, but how does it influence the policy? Maybe it doesn't do it today, but hopefully we need it, more and more of such examples to be able to influence policy in the future. That was another thought that I had, maybe. What about the science and policy gap that we often talked about? How do we how do we bridge that one? Yeah, I mean, in fact, I think for me, honestly, it was a good learning. Today, I think the session that we had in the morning with the three persons from uh, with the policy experience, I think they said it very clearly that in our part of the world, the impression I got was that, uh, although not because I'm an Indian, but I think the impression I got was that perhaps the people from India said that they have more backing of science as compared to perhaps our uh, you know, the, uh, deputy secretary from Bangladesh, who in a very candid way said that maybe that access is not available right now. There is a huge gap. Of course, that was also seconded by our you know, colleague from India, who also said that uh, currently the language that scientists speak is not necessarily fathomed or understood easily by the policy makers. And that has to be bridged, plus the credibility of science itself, you know. I mean, is it uh, done with a vested interest? Then there's a big question mark on that science. And uh, perhaps those people backed with a lot of money are more able to access policy makers. You know, I mean, this is my view about, again, coming from a civil society perspective. That's a fear I have that, uh, you know, uh, the science which really is pro poor, whether that even has access to policy makers is a question. I mean, it's a whole lot of mixed feelings and impressions because I don't think there's anything very cut and dried and black or white. It's a lot of gray, I think. Uh, also, there is this feeling that there are more and more instances where uh, what one of our colleagues spoke about, where in India, for example, a lot of civil society work back, backed by scientific evidence has been able to influence policy as well. So it's a mix, basically, you know, of, of science policy divide. Maybe we've reached somewhere, but not definitely the last mile. Left. 
not whole of it. So what happens next? Do these strands go their own separate ways or how do we weave them together no, I for believe, livelihood? I would believe, I think the organizers themselves in whatever discussions I've had, being the moderator, being on the sidelines, you know, I mean, I've heard uh, their plans and I think they have been speaking about facts that uh, they would like to keep the discussion on, discussion rolling. I think uh, to an extent which is fair, I think they're leaving it also on the participants to see whether they click together or not. Because it should not be driven, it should not be externally funded entirely all the time. Like for example, I mean, just to give you a small instance, yesterday when we were looking for volunteers to draft the declaration, as a moderator I waited, insisted that there will be three volunteers coming without any incentives etc. And I think we need to wait for such processes as well. We need to wait and see whether people really, I mean if the listserv that gets established or the e-group that gets established whether people also take the initiative. So it should be a voluntary initiative, collective initiative of everybody of course facilitated by uh, particularly the organizers who uh, set the ball rolling I would say. And I do believe that there are thoughts of this happening and this continuing. I'm not sure about very concrete things except the listserv and the e-group that is being spoken about, but I guess that intent is there very much. So watch this space. Yeah, okay. <laughs> surely. Thank, Thank you. you.